there was nobody on the Russian space program called Mr. Gorsky. So he got back to Earth and they said, Mr. Armstrong, who is Mr. Who is Mr. Gorsky? What did you mean when you said good luck, Mr. Gorsky? And he said, no, no, it's very private. I shouldn't have said it. It's, it's very bad that I mentioned it. And so for 20 years, they would ask him, what did you mean when you said good luck, Mr. Gorsky? And in the mid-1990s, he was asked yet again. And he said, you know, I think I can tell you now, because Mr. and Mrs. Gorsky, they're both dead. It happened a long time ago. When I was a small boy, I was playing baseball. I was cat catch with my younger brother. And my younger brother threw the baseball into the backyard of our neighbors, who were called Mr. and Mrs. Gorsky. And I was very frightened to get the ball back, because they were very, very nasty neighbors. They shouted at us. We were afraid of them. And I went very carefully into the backyard of uh, my neighbor, Mr. Gorsky. And while I was in the backyard, uh, I overheard Mr. and Mrs. Gorsky having a very, very private bedroom argument. And it became clear that Mr. Gorsky was asking Mrs. Gorsky to do some very private bedroom activity, which, as this is a mixed class, and I don't want to get fired, I'm going to clean up. And I'm going to say that Mr. Gorsky was asking for a Mishiatsu massage from Mrs. Gorsky. I can promise you that it was something much more unmentionable than that, which is only legitimate to husbands and wives. And Mrs. Gorsky was getting more and more upset, more and more angry, and eventually Mrs. Gorsky said, You want a shiatsu massage? You want a shiatsu massage from me? You'll get a shiatsu massage from me when a little boy who lives next door walks on the moon! <laughs> I hope that all of those years later, um, he did get his wish. Now I should stress that this is only a joke, and if you look at my slide carefully, you can see it's only a joke because there's no reference. The other quotes from the slide said have a reference. But my reference to the moon does have some relevance, because we often use the term moonshot to describe a human achievement. Some people would say walking on the moon was mankind's ultimate achievement. Well, this course looks at another moonshot. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy said this, Mankind now holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. But 50 years have gone by, and we have not abolished human poverty. This is the moonshot for your generation, and ending global poverty going to be just as hard as it was to get to the moon. And this is still a mystery. The solution to global poverty is something which taxes the experts. You're going to hear on this course from many experts. They have not solved the problem, and they don't agree with each other. So there is every opportunity for you and your generation to make an original contribution. There is no formula to learn. There is no magic wand. This is an ongoing crisis that calls creativity of your mind, the passion of your heart, and the sweat of your brow. So I need to start with a couple of practical matters. What is the number one complaint I hear from SCTV students about lectures? The no any guesses? <laughs> Don't mention any names, please. Um, typically, people say that they're not interacting enough, they're boring. Um, so I'm going to do some voting in this class. So tear off that blue and red strip and salt it in half. Just detach it from the, the big sheet of paper I'm going to ask you to vote several times during this lecture. What is the number one complaint I hear from MIT faculty about you, about MIT students? Any guesses? In fact, this is the only complaint I've heard. Uh, I've heard uh, the head of the collaboration say you need to get them to stop, stop them texting and watching laptops during lectures. So I, I only see one laptop on. Would you mind closing it? And I promise, if, if we're in the ad drop please, I'm going to try to make it very interactive. I've given you some notes where you can basically just fill in the blanks, and this lecture will be uploaded. So um, if I don't succeed, if I don't keep my end of the bargain in making it interactive, then um, please tell me. Um, but I need you to be psychologically in the room. If you're texting or, or using a laptop, you're not here in the room mentally or with me to have an interaction. So you've got the fill-in-the-blanks note sheet. Um, I need to announce the group that was going to meet on Friday, in which joint signs for the Chinese New Year holiday. You have been moved to 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. on Wednesday. Okay.
So now I'm going to start with a moral dilemma. In 1841, a U.S. ship called the William Brown sank. A large group of passengers, it had about 30 passengers on board, it made it to a lifeboat. And the following day, April 20th, a storm started swapping the lifeboat. And they were in danger of sinking. Should you save the women and children, or if you save those best able to row? Give me a vote. Okay? No extensions, no extensions. Give me a vote. Hide one color, hide one color. Give me a vote. Give me a vote. I think it's about, ooh, I think it's about, it's about, I think it's 60% blue. I think 60% of you would save, would uh, save those best able to row. What in fact happened was the first mate, Francis Rose, decided to save those best able to row. So he saved, he threw 14 men and two women into the water and they drowned. And there was then a trial. They couldn't catch the first mate. Francis Rhodes escaped, but they caught one of the other um, crew members, Alexander Holmes, and they put him on trial for manslaughter. So if you're on the jury, you're one of the 12 members in the jury, do you find him guilty or not guilty? Red for guilty, blue for not guilty. Okay, I think, I think this time, I think this time the blue was have it by about 80%. Well, in fact, the result was he wasn't hung, but he got six months in jail, um, and he got a $20 fine. Um, but he was, not, the, he was not in command. It was uh, Rose who was in command. What would a utilitarian say? What does the principle of utility say? What would Jeremy Bentham have said? Uh, you did the reading, you might be able to answer this. Any, any volunteers? What does the principle of utility say? One person? Maximize utility, maximize the happiness of the group. So if you're a utilitarian, you will possibly make the calculation that if I save those best able to row, the whole group might survive, therefore you save those best able to row. They didn't do that on the Titanic. On the Titanic, uh, there was quite a lot of preference for women and children. In fact, some of the richest men in the world drowned on the Titanic because they, they lent women and children to the license license. So Al Cole the Master drowned. So, this is a quote from uh, Jeremy Bentham, the first one of the fill in the blanks. The community is a fictitious body. The interest of the community, then, is the sum of the interests of the several members who compose it. So, if you have any spiritual, magical belief in the value of society as a whole, Jeremy Bentham is not on your side. So, let's meet Jeremy Bentham. British philosopher, died in 1832. Uh, he's associated with University College London, and he's still there. This is his body. If you go to the lobby of University College London, you'll see how he was buried. Um, he wasn't there. He had himself turned into an auto-icon, as it said. Um, so, uh, there he is. Uh, can you imagine what sort of attitude this person has to, tradi to traditional religion of any kind? He urinates on traditional religion. I mean, his, his body has been disposed of with a minimum of sacred process. Um, however, this isn't his complete body, because the head was embalmed separately. And as you can see, the process for embalming the head did not go well. I have seen the embalmed head of Ho Chi Minh, much better than this. <laughs> I have seen the embalmed head of Ferdinand Marcos, former President Bill. He looks younger dead than he did alive. This was a significant disaster. And yet, some students from King's College London, the, the London colleges have big rivalries, and so they wanted to play a prank on a University College London, so they kidnapped the head in October 1975, or perhaps I should say headnapped, and um, they demanded a ransom. So they demanded a ransom of 100 pounds for the house and shelter, and the college said, we don't think we should give way to, to terrorism. So we will only pay 10 pounds. So they pay, pay 10 pounds and they got the head back and it's been under lock and key for everything. If I get to be very famous and I have my body somewhere in the lobby of the SUTV and you have steal my head, please don't pay any money to get it back. What are you going to do with that? <laughs> <laughs> so was it right to kidnap the head? Well, 
Well, clearly, if you are a utilitarian, then the answer is yes. Mr. Bentham was past caring about the head, at least it raised 10 pounds for charity. So let's quote Bentham on this. It is the greatest happiness of the greatest number that is the measure of right and wrong. Second to the blank quote. This is one of the most famous quotes in all of philosophy. The greatest happiness of the greatest number. And in a sense, it's proposing a new religion without God. It's a way of deciding on right, uh, questions of right and wrong without the need for deity. Um, so I'll repeat, the greatest happiness is the greatest number that is the measure of right and wrong. So let's pose a dilemma. For a country to become a developed country, is it acceptable for the labor conditions of some workers to get worse during industrialization? Blue for yes, red for no. So give me an answer. Is it acceptable for the labor conditions of some to get worse during industrialization? Blue for yeah, yes, red for no. Okay, I, I, that looks like the reds have the majority, I think. I think the reds are probably 55 or 60 percent. Well, if you're holding red, you're probably going to be very happy when you see the next slide. So the next slide is a video of a, a worker in Bangladesh. I'm sorry, it's going to take a few seconds to load this. She's working at the Haynes plant. Um, they actually named the, the factory here. It's the Harvest Rich plant. Um, she's earning 53 cents a day, and she thinks the salary is getting a lot fair. And I'm not sure what's going to play. Let me try this one more time. Thank you. 
deprivations that are intrinsically important. Not necessarily money. He thinks that money is only a means to an end. So he tries to measure your access to freedoms. And I'll try to illustrate what that means. Let's approach the illustration with this comparison. I have two countries. Country A, which has a per capita U.S. income of $24,036. And country B, which has a per capita income of $15,452. So give me a vote. Which country is more developed? Well, that, that's the logical answer. If that's the only thing you know, the only reason to revoke blue is that you think it's a trick question, which is not a bad assumption, um, because these are the two countries. So, uh, Equatorial Guinea, A, is richer in monetary terms, but you're likely to live for only 52 years in Equatorial Guinea, compared to 79 years in Chile. Your baby is 10 times more likely to die before the age of 5, in Equatorial Guinea, and Equatorial Guinea has only about 58% of the relevant age cohort in primary compared to 93% of Chileans. So if you only consider average incomes, and some utilitarians do that, they say that they want to measure happiness, but frequently it's practically impossible, so they end up measuring income. And so many utilitarians would judge that Equatorial Guinea is the more developed of the two countries. So this type of contrast has led the United Nations to publish a special statistic to try to reflect the true levels of development. It's called the Human Development Index, and this is the concept of human development that's given its name to this course. So here you can see it takes these three things together. It takes life expectancy, mean years of schooling, per capita income together. And based on those three things combined, Equatorial Guinea has an HDI, Human Development Index, of only 0.55. Out of 200 countries in the world, it's way down at 136. Chile is considered to be developed. It's 40 at the top. It's a member of the OECD. So it combines these three things, average income, average life expectancy, and average schooling. In fact, Equatorial Guinea has a very high income for a very special reason. It is an oil-rich with a relatively small population, and not much of the oil has trickled down to the general population. The oil wealth is largely controlled uh, by the rulers. It's an oil-rich oligarchy, or tempted to make a pun and call it oligarchy, countries in the Middle East, um, and we don't consider it to be developed. Now, the way that the Human Development Index has been calculated has been changed recently, and it might possibly, ultimately, help people like this. Thank you. 
development index consists of these three components, average income, average years in school, and life expectancy. Now, Amartya Sen believes that the HDI approach is an improvement on what went before. Before 1990, development economists generally only talked about per capita income, per capita gross domestic product. Um, but Amartya Sen said this isn't the whole story. There, there should be a way of improving this so that you have even better metrics, measurements of development. So now we come to another thing for mentioned in the chapter I'm going to ask you to read. Um, he is Harvard philosopher John Rawls. And when he was just a little bit older than you guys, when he was 25, he witnessed a very important historical event. He volunteered for the American Army after Pearl Harbor, and he ended up in the Philippines. And he was there to witness the surrender of the Japanese forces in the Philippines. He was a common soldier, not a high, didn't have a high rank. And Emperor Hirohito ordered General Yamashita, who was hiding up in the mountains with his army in the Ipagao Triangle, uh, and told him to surrender. So the American general said, well, we need some volunteers to march up into the jungle and escort General Yamashita back. And John Rawls was one of those uh, people. So he actually saw one of the last days of World War II anywhere in the world. On um, September 2nd, 1945, nearly a month after the fall was gone on Hiroshima, he was witnessing the surrender of the Japanese forces in the Philippines. So he gets out of the army, he becomes a philosopher. What were his ideas? He writes a bit about his experiences of war as creating a, a desire to become a philosopher and to write about justice. So what was his idea? One of his big ideas is called the original position. So the concept of the original position is a philosophical, abstract concept that you decide rules of justice in a position where you do not know your future wealth, poverty, sickness, or health. You make general laws for society not knowing what your actual position will be. So I've asked three volunteers to help me with an illustration, so this is where you come forward. So in the original position, they don't know whether in the future they're going to be very poor, whether they're going to have the same disease, whether they're going to be billionaires or paupers. And they make decisions in a state where, so if you could stand um, in front of this red sheet facing the wall, I'm afraid, because I want to put some signs on your back. I want to put some signs on your back. And aren't you going to? Okay, I'm going to put a sheet over your head. And okay, you get closer so that I'm covering all of so this. Is, symbolically, this is the veil of ignorance. This is philosophically the state like a jewelry chain. You're disinterested. You don't know what you are. Okay, and please, I'm going to put your future life on your back. So I'm going to take something to your back. Okay. Um, I'm going to have... Your future life, and this is your future life. So this is an illustration, and I'm going to give them two minutes to make a constitution for their future society. So they're like, it's, it's a little bit like an embryo's parliament, like an embryo's parliament, because they don't know their future lives. But they're very high-functioning embryos, because they have the power of debate and rapid reason. Okay, everybody stand up for two minutes and do the same thing. So they're going to be deliberating. Stand up and talk to the people next to you and make uh, rules for an ideal society. Maybe you can help some of the people you've seen. Okay? Yeah, stand up. I know it's a pain. Stand up. Talk to today yourself for two minutes. Discuss with your
as valid as the idea of redistributing marriage partners in a society where you choose your husband or wife for yourself. So he is fundamentally opposed to the things that uh, John Rawls is arguing for. What would libertarians say about this very Singaporean map? I went to the Singapore centralized housing map and I looked up the racial quotas for my building up in Sengang. And I pretended I happened to be Malay. There, there isn't actually a button for white people on this. Um, and so I, I pressed, well, I pretend I was Malay, and it, it says that under the, the racial diversity quotas for that particular building, um, I, I'm allowed to sell it to whoever I want. But if I was Chinese, I can't sell it to one more Chinese person because that would upset the quota. What would a libertarian say about this? What would a libertarian say? There shouldn't be any quotas. Absolutely. Everybody should be treated the same. If I want to sell it to Malay, Indian, Chinese, white person, for a libertarian, this is very offensive. Uh, so on some issues, uh, you could argue this is very freedom-based. This is a very Senian approach. Senian is the adjective I apply to Amar Hussein, because you could argue that this is giving positive liberty to the Indian Singaporean who might otherwise never be able to or his or her own home, or to a Malay. Uh, um, Lee Kuan Yew argues in his autobiography that's exactly what happens because sometimes a Chinese owner will have to sell at a slightly lower price because the quota doesn't exist and only a Malay or Indian uh, buyer can buy it. Uh, what do you think the average American would say about this map? In America, the culture of housing is very, very against this sort of quota for housing, but not necessarily for education. There have been many states which have affirmative action rules, which means that African Americans have a certain quota for places and colleges. Uh, but they've never had anything like this for housing. Singapore is the opposite. Singapore has the quota system for housing, but when it comes to education rules, the idea is whoever gets the top grade gets the place. So it's very much a question of culture. So here's a formal rule. This is taken from the Stanford uh, Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Negative liberty, which is what the libertarians care about, negative liberty is the absence of obstacles, barriers, or constraints. Amartya Sen is interested in positive liberty, freedom, which is the possibility of acting in such a way as to take control of one's life. So if you can go to school, you have positive freedom. You have the chance to live to be 79, you have positive freedom. The libertarian really doesn't care. I mean, if, if you have not interfered with his property rights, and uh, Amos lives to be up in 32, but, you know, you haven't interfered with his property rights, you haven't imposed any nasty barriers or controls, that's fine. Um, so that's why we call it negative liberty, the absence of quotas, barriers, and constraints. I sometimes have a tr problem remembering which word means which. So if you're in that category, you might want to memorize this rhyme. So the rhyme goes, if it's rules you fear, liberty's the key. If it's being poor, you need to be free. But the formal definition is actually very good to quote. This formal definition, um, the possibility of acting in such a way as to take control of one's life. This is what Amartya Sen is talking about in the chapter you're going to read. Society, the most just society is the society of the max 
positive freedoms, and utilitarians believe you just try to sum total happiness. You try to add all happiness together to, to create the most just society. I'm not going to tell, I'm not recording your votes. As best, as best you can understand the adjectives as of now, give me a vote. Give me a vote. Okay, I think, you know, I think uh, Sen has it. I think Sen has it. I think Sen is about 60%. So these are the four perspectives. So when you read the chapter, you're going to come across these four perspectives. And um, I, the reading is only 33 pages long. Throughout the whole course, I've been told I'm not supposed to give you more than 50 pages. So you can predict very exactly what you're going to get per week. I'm going to give you a reading quiz on Ethernet when you come into the small group. But it's going to be pretty easy to predict what's going to come up. If you turn the note sheet over, the questions for the readings are, are on the back of that sheet. So it shouldn't be too difficult if you keep that sheet open um, to predict what's going to come up. Any questions? Any questions of what I've said before uh, on what's gone up to now? Uh, you can ask them during the school group as well. I'm going to upload this slide set as well. Uh, any questions? They'll probably come up during the small group. Okay, here's another personal testimony. I'm going to leave you with another moral dilemma. How can freedom from crimes be brought into the human development next? If you read Marchesek's full book, it's clear that he would like to bring freedom of crime, from crime into the HDI. Uh, it's not there yet. Um, we'll leave, listen to this interview. Um, Marchesek actually witnessed a murder in his house when he's 10 years old. Not exactly in his house. He was in West Bengal during a time of intense fighting between Muslims and Hindus. It was a time of partition between Bangladesh and India. And a gardener who worked for one of his neighbors Karamiya, he had been bleeding, he'd been stabbed in the back, and a market said he was only 10 years old, started screaming for his dad to get help. His dad took the gardener to a hospital, but uh, Karamiya died. So he writes about freedom from crime in this. This woman is giving testimony to the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. So she's a student, exactly in your position. This is her first semester at her university in Ljubljana, the capital of Slovenia. And a girl who befriended her, Ravana, who says, you can stay in my apartment. And she arranges for uh, Jana to have a job interview with a, a part, for a part-time job in an accounting firm. And this is her testimony. The next morning, I went to an office where I set up for an interview with a woman. The interview had lasted about 10 minutes when two men entered the room and dragged me away to a car. I was screaming and resisting. I was taken somewhere blindfolded with a break many times and beaten because I was resisting. I was dragged with heroin. All my things were taken and I was forced to wear sexually provocative clothes. I was forced to do prostitution in Ljubljana for about four months. I was repeatedly threatened in order to obey them, especially by the life and freedom of my little sister. And I was constantly reminded how easy it is for them to put her so, we're still in the add drop weeks. So I should address the, court, the question whether you should drop this course. Should you do this course? Um, I'm going to quote from this doctor, Dr. Paul Farmer, who wrote this excellent book called To Repair the World. And he graduated from Harvard and then spent most of his life practicing medicine in either Haiti, of course, country in the Western Hemisphere, or Rwanda. And he compares the decision to practice medicine to a particular scene from the film The Matrix. And he gets all of these Harvard Medical School graduates and tries to appeal to them that it would be a good idea not to become rich in New York or Los Angeles practicing medicine, but to join him in Rwanda. And this is the scene from The Matrix that he's referring to. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain. But you feel it. You felt it your entire life. And there's something wrong. You don't know what it is. But it's there. Like a splinter in your mind. 
Well, if you consider some of the personal interviews that you've seen on this lecture, the interview with the young eight-year-old boy working in the copper mine, or John and being forced into prostitution, or um, Halima working in a factory, you should probably echo those words. You know something's wrong with the world. And if you feel you have that splinter in your mind, I want to warn you, I'm not going to make you more comfortable. I'm going to take hold of that splinter and I'm going to push it in deeper. Dr. Farmer gives a medical graduation speech where he finally uh, compares the decision to this last quote from um, The Matrix.